Hi there, I'm Elias Sipka, and this is the Patros Review. Now this is part 2 of the D-Spectrum 13, which is marked my 325th review, and uh, I was supposed to have done this yesterday, but I fell ill for a whole day with uh, some virus, I don't know what it was. Of course, now I'm better, so I'm going to do this in part 3. I mean, part 3 will come maybe within a day or so. Now, this D-Spectrum thing is... Just basically where I review the, all the crappy films I've done over the past 25 reviews. And for those who don't know, the D special refers to the three lowest rate, ratings in my grading ladder. The D+, plus, which is a 3 out of 10, meaning a film is disappointingly mediocre. A D, which is 2 out of 10, meaning it's bad. And a D-, minus, which is 1 out of 10, meaning it's terrible. Anyway. So, let's start. Now... First up is Bullfight of Love, which is commonly known in English as In the Realm of the Senses. This is a Japanese film, of actually a Japanese-French co-production, directed by Nagisa Oshima in 1976. I gave this a D-. This is terrible. To this day, holding the record of having the most screenings at the Cannes Film Festival when it originally premiered, 13 screenings were arranged because demand for the movie was extremely high, and which could only be developed in France, because Japan's strict censorship standards on not showing genitalia meant that no Japanese producer could touch this film. The 1976 French-Japanese production titled Bullet Fly of Love in its original Japanese title, but like I said, best known around the world as In Realm of the Senses, is the ultimate art house atrocity from the French. This boring, sick and ugly movie is the perfect example of why the art house genre receives much bashing from those who claim art house movies nothing more than depraved pornography. Based on a true story, an infamous Tokyo urban legend of Sada Abe, the geisha accidentally killed a brothel owner lover and cut of his John Thomas, ultimately found wandering the streets with that severed wang all the way back in 1936. One hell of an ugly, depraved, misogynistic piece of hardcore pornography with one hell of a nasty added bonus. It features CP, and borderline sexual molestation of a five-year-old child, in the uncut version at least, although for the current Australian DVDs of this movie has that scene optically refrained to mask that. Anyway, but actually the original Australian DVDs from Adam Entertainment actually were uncut, which featured that scene. So if any of you out there have the original Australian Madman disc of it, replace it for the, uh, the uh, current version. Now, this uh, atrocious outhouse atrocity was loved by practically every, every Japanese critic, and Western critics tend to be more mixed. But really, there's no reason for the director to take this film to the depths he ultimately did. Now, the Hotel Roman Steam franchise. Now, this is a uh, franchise of games made by a Korean modder named Mr. Choi. And the first of these games came out in 2004. I gave these games pretty much a D-. They're terrible, but I'll explain why. In 2003, Mr. Choi, which, who was a Korean modder specializing in Wolfenstein 3D mods, decided to make an adult themed mod of Wolfenstein 3D. His game was called Hotel Pornostein, which had the player infiltrate a German nationalist brothel, killing SS hookers. But what made this one stand out amongst the few that played it back in the day, and you can still get to, uh, that game on uh, certain sites were the X-ray nude sprites. For example, the German Shepherd guard dogs were replaced by naked women with whips and stills on the walls of real-life uh, adult actresses and playboy centerfolds, and the machine gun replaced by what looks like something I can't describe right now. This game was only available on Mr. Choice's personal website for a short time before being replaced by the Hope Till Romanstein franchise of games, but some websites today have the game available, so if you want to look it up, I will review that game in the future. Oh, by the way, as for compatibility concerns, well, if you're the type of hardcore gamer who can install HDM successfully on your computer, then getting that one will be a piece of cake, as long as you have a DOS box on the computer, that is. Mr. Choi then replaced the game with Hotel Roman Steam, a wall 3D mod that is essentially porno steam, but with all the nudity removed, and replaced with female sprites wearing various degrees of clothing, from the color-coded bras and panties of the early games, to the reasonably chaste lingerie and dress of the later ones. These Hotel Romanstein games exist in a large variety number of versions, from, from the original DOS format to the 4GL ports playable on modern machines without the need for an emulator. And the only difference between the original Hotel Pornstein games and these ones are the lack of nude sprites or triple X rated wallpapers, replaced by a focus of post-millennial manga anime styles. 
Now having said that, the Hotel Roman Steam franchise is in a word atrocious. The concept of shooting female sprites tends to be misogynistic, but at least the Point of Steam games dirty graphics adds a certain dirty charm to playing it. The Roman Steam franchise lacks any sort of selling point to it. Plus, this is one occasion where the Wolf 3D engine fails to provide an entertaining experience, unless you're the type of person who loves shooting female manga sprites. Now, Future War, directed by Anthony Dublin in the year 1994, but released in 1997. I also gave this one a D-. minus. During the director video boom of the 1990s, B-grade Synthetica had its moment of glory. Dozens of reasonable B-grade science fiction action flicks using androids and cyborgs have filled the video store shelves, including a whole heap from director Albert Payune, who was considered the master of this particular type of film. And by the 2010s, almost all of these had developed a nostalgic cult following amongst their fans. But for every decent director via Synthetica like Nemesis, Project Shadow Chase, and Cyborg Cup, there were a handful of bad ones. Future War, an ultra cheap Synthetica that was originally shot in 1994, back when this genre was at its peak, but not released until 1997, which was right after the genre had largely died away. With its admittedly cool plot of a runaway human slave returning to the place his people refer to as heaven, the, pe the planet Earth, while his cyborg slavers send dinosaur puppets to track him down, while the runaway attempts to fight for his freedom. Future was just crippled by the sh seriously shoestring budget. The fight choreography is sloppy and the visual effects are pathetic. Day of the Dead Bloodline, directed by Hector Hernandez Vikens in the year 2017. I gave this one a D. The second step of remaking the awesome George A. Romero zombie masterpiece Day of the Dead, the first was the atrocious 2008 director video remake, or there has been a television series that also adapted this, com coming out in 2021. This 2017 remake was the last film produced by Millennium Films, a label that had been making many B-grader action flicks during the 2000s, usually starring the likes of Steven Seagal. And this has all the hallmarks of being such a production. The actors are a bunch of amateurs, the fast-moving zombies will put up quite a few purists, although at least these zombies don't crawl around on ceilings like the ones in the 2008 remake, as well as the blood from neck wounds spurning out like they were shot at with a high-pressure hose, and a short side decision to relabel the zombies as rotters. Now, it could be possible that the universe this movie takes place in doesn't know the word zombie, but it's just plain silly. Oh, and the decision to turn this movie's version of legendary good zombie bub into a semi-dead lecture was also a bad idea. And that's the last one, The Terminators, that's plural, directed by Xavier S. Poslowski in the year 2009. I gave this one a D. One of the Asylum's most infamous mockbusters, not due to its badness, but due to the fact that those pirates decided to shut down the production in order to comply with a cease and desist order from Hollywood, but not only completed the film, they released it. While not amongst the worst of the Asylum's infamous mockbusters, it's still a pretty damn bad and haphazardly put together piece of turkey designed to trick people on the video store shelves into renting them. Although by this point the Asylum's reputation was well established to the point that only hardcore Asylum fans and bad movie masochists were seeking these out. As for plot, this has very little to do with the Terminator franchise instead being somewhere close to the post-millennial Battlestar Galactica with an army of identical looking androids wreaking havoc on humanity, with our last hope being a group of no-name brand civilians trying to find a way to access the somewhat literal off-switch to turn these nasty robots off. Okay, now that's it for uh, the Spectrum 13 Part 2. Part 3 will show up soon, maybe within a day or so. Now I don't do requests, but if you have any questions about DVDs or films, just hit me up in the comments section, I'll be happy to answer. I hope you guys enjoy yourselves, and stay safe. See ya.